This is lecture 13 on slope stability. Normally I've given these lectures live, but due to the coronavirus invasion, I'm going to do this in a little different way, over with us, with me in the background giving a voiceover of the slide presentations, which I've used since I started teaching this course. And this topic is a interesting topic and at this point we're beginning to transition from purely oh basis you know science basis type engineering basis type of thing such as uh, consolidation and elasticity and that kind of thing and uh, effective stress and all of this to more of the actual design of earth structures and the first earth structures we're going to consider are those of slopes. Slopes have been used since the beginning. They occur in nature. Their failure is usually catastrophic. So this is a very important topic. And so we must take a look at these with care. Slow failure is one of the most important types of failures in geotechnical engineering, and their, the slow failures are generally catastrophic. In the early 1900s, uh, slow failures in Sweden uh, led to the development of the first analytic method of geotechnical analysis, which was rotational failure analysis using slip circle and method of slices, which actually predates to some degree uh, Tersagi's work on consolidation. And the person that is, whose name is largely associated with that is Walmar Fulenius, who developed this method. There are, but before we get into that, let's talk about the different types of slope stability. We have falls, which are surface rock. We're very familiar with this in this part of the country. Uh, topples, rotation of rock away from a joint fixture. Those are mostly rock failures and we're not going to spend a lot of time on rock failures. We have slides. And there are two types of slides. We talk about rotational slides um, and translational slides. We see both types of slope failure. We're going to actually discuss both of them and that's pretty much what we're going to cover. We have spreads um, that like transitional translational slides, except the material separates and move part, moves apart as it moves downward. And last, flows uh, such as avalanches, volcanoes, um, we're not going to be talking about those either. They actually involve more of a, a change in the um, material um, of, of, the, of, the slide, which, of the slope, which we're not really going to investigate. The first thing we're going to talk about is limit equilibrium analysis. Uh, earlier in the course, I talked about two types. We basically split soil mechanics um, and, the, and the way that soils respond into two broad regions. And first of those are failures due to elasticity or deformation failures in an elastic way. And then we talked about Plast, purely plastic failures. We are adopted earlier in this course an elastoplastic, uh, uh, and let me start again, an elastic uh, plastic, purely plastic type of soil failure. And that involves that we basically consider the soil in one or two modes. Either the soil is in an elastic mode or it's in a pla purely plastic mode. I know that consolidation, which we just went through, kind of complicates that. But those are the two modes. Slope stability is the first mode of failure where we really look at a purely plastic type of failure. And to deal with purely plastic failure, we employ what we call limit equilibrium analysis. We evaluate the slope, and we'll see this, we'll use this again when we come to shallow foundations and to a much, much lesser extent deep foundations, we're going to evaluate the slope as if we're about to failure, fail and determine the shear strength along the surface of that failure surface. 
Uh, the computed stresses are compared to the shear strength to determine the factor of safety. And I know that LRFD complicates this analysis, and we're going to talk about LRFD and foundations. But basically, the factor of safety in the in simplest terms is the strength of the material against the over the load that is being applied to it. And we're going to say, we're going to use this again, so let's get used to it. Generally speaking, effective stress analysis is used in slope stability. Uh, the one time we do use total stress analysis is when excess poor water pressures are present. Um, one thing we have to find with, and it's true with any limit equilibrium analysis, we have to find the failure surface. Uh, the failure surface is not obvious. Sometimes it's, you know, in slope stability, we think of the classic rotational failure, but we have translational failures too. So we have to consider those. And it's very much a trial and error problem. Uh, it depends upon the geometry of the slope. It depends upon the, um, the, the materials, how they're layered, the presence of water. Um, to be able to do this um, to any kind of trial and error problem effectively requires the ability to do a lot, to do quickly go through many different test cases. And that's where computer software makes that search more effective. And we're going to see that in particularly in slope stability. But before we get to slope stability, we need to talk about some basic theory behind plasticity. Plasticity, as a general rule, requires the re requires that we use um, non-closed form solutions. So closed form solutions are not particularly useful because of the complexity of the problem and the fact, as we discussed earlier, that plastic solutions are path dependent. How they happen depends a depends upon how when we're starting a stress history and how we get to the failure point. Um, upper and lower bound plasticity, and this little the text in front of you is from Roy, is can be simplified into two basic parts, into, or two basic points at which we consider failure to take place. Lower bound theorem, as Baroy points out, is the true failure load is larger than the load corresponding to an equilibrium system. Basically, lower bound theorem says that, the, that it has failed if any point in the system has failed plastically. Upper bound theorem says that the true failure load is smaller than the load corresponding to a mechanism if that load is determined using the virtual work principle. And in practical terms, that means that the the entire failure surface, whatever failure surface that happens to be, has failed. Now, obviously, you know, somewhere between these two is reality. We don't want to sit around and wait till the entire failure surface has failed, but we don't necessarily want to um, stop things and, and not when just a little part of it has failed. So, usually in in the idea behind upper and lower bound theory is that we bracket the solution between two extremes. And we're going to take um, an example of this, um, a vertical slope and cohesive soil. And, you know, in this area, we talk a lot about, I mean, most of our soils in this area are clay. They have they, and usually if you put a excavator or a backhoe or even a shovel to it, you dig down, you pull it out, at least for a while, and if you don't dig too deep, you'll get a, uh, you, will, you will get a, a nice vertical cut. You can get a vertical cut in the system. It won't necessarily last, but you'll get one. And obviously we'd like to know if we're going to do this on a large scale, and in situations such as, for example, trenches, how deep can they go? Uh, how, how long can we, can, can we expect them to hold up if we do cut one? Okay, 
we're going to look at two different cases of this fairly simple problem. And the first case you're looking at is a cut. And all we're going to do is we're going to do a very simplistic approach. We're going to say, well, this slope will fail when we exceed the uh, uh, unconfined compression strength of the material. Basically, that's what you're trying to do. Or, and the reason why we can do that, if you remember from your from the unconfined compression test, if we have a purely clay material, that you've got a sigma 3, 3 is at zero, and a sigma 1 is at the unconfined compression strength, which is QU. So you have got that, and then on the other hand, you've got that slope. At that very corner of the slope, you've got no horizontal pressures because there's nothing you know, really, you know, there's no conf way of confining it. You have a, the vertical pressure is essentially the at the co at that corner is basically the effective stress, which is simply the unit weight of the soil times the height h. You know, it, I know Veroid has gamma z times plus h. Well, you know, at at the base, the effective of, of that down there where x, the x and z axis meet, the effective stress is h times gamma. So you put that in, and basically you can say that this, this will fail as a lower bound. The first time a failure will occur, possibly occur, is when basically the height of that slope is equal to the QU, the unconfined compression strength, over gamma, which is the unit weight. Or if we, or if we, you know, since QU U is equal to 2 times C, which is the radius of Mohr's circle, then that height at the equation at the bottom of the page, the height, of the, as long if the height of that is greater than 2 times the cohesion of the soil over gamma, you'll have failure. That's the lower bound. There are, you know, obviously there may be other other factors which would may not, not happen, but it will fail at one point, and that one point is the corner of the slope. The upper bound solution takes a little more sophisticated. It says, well, instead of just, you know, doing raw more circle, let's consider the fact that slopes have a usually have a failure wedge. And we're going to talk about that more when we get to lateral earth pressures. And that failure wedge has a weight, and it bears down upon a, a what we're going to call it a planar failure surface, uh, which is at some angle alpha to that to to the to the uh, vertical. And we're going to see at what point, you know, it's it's kind of uh, where that weight will have two components reactions to it by static equilibrium. Uh, normal force, which actually uh, pushes up on the surface, and the tangential force, which is actually what is trying to drive that surface to separate. So we put in static equilibrium, as you see, and we find out that the, min that the uh, H has a minimum where alpha is equal to 45 degrees. So therefore, if we do all the math as you see in front of you, then that the critical height, the height at which we have failure, is 4C over, over gamma, which is twice the lower bound. So therefore, we at this point have two different, two different points at which we have possible failure. The question is, which one is right? But we've at least bracketed, at least we've gotten to the point where we've bracketed the failure between two different values. Now, this is it's a very simplistic analysis. The critical height, the height at which we have failure, is somewhere between 2C over gamma and 4C over gamma. Um, it's possibly the lower bound is the most conservative and the upper bound is the least conservative. So what we can do is instead of just saying, well, you know, it's, this isn't, 
this isn't going to, you know, we're, we're not getting anywhere. We're just, we, we're still in, in a zone. What we're going to do is we're going to define something called the slope stability number. And the slope stability number is basically we're going to say to solve for the constant because the only difference between the two critical heights is the constant they're multiplied by. Is it two to four? We can say that if we rearrange it for an n naught, that n naught will be somewhere between two and four. And so if we want to add a factor of safety, which we like to do, then n naught is equal to factor of safety times gamma h over c. And so we now have a, a, a kind of a more of a complete view of things where if we can use experiment or additional theory to establish n naught, then we can, you know, by considering different failure modes, different failure surfaces, that kind of thing. And then we throw a factor of safety in for the uncertainties due to variations of soil properties and whatnot. We can get a fairly complete picture of whether a certain slope will fail or, fail or not. Now, I mentioned in passing the whole business of failure surfaces. We talked about a planar failure surface. Finding the failure surface is one of the most important um, parts of slope stability analysis. And we're going to, <clears throat> basically, we're going to start with a very simple case. The first is an infinite slope analysis and assumes that the failure surface is under the surface slope and is parallel to it. Usually that is an issue, particularly with rocks, when you've got a weak layer that's above a hard bedrock layer. A planar, a planar, a planar failure analysis means that failure surface is under the slope but not parallel to it. Some of this gets us into rock mechanics and we're not going to go there. Let's start, however, with the general case of planar slope failure. And this is from your FE exam. Uh, notes. The slope along a, a planar surface, and we're going to assume that there's some kind of, of dirt pile on top of it, basically. And this is basically this is the same problem you had in statics with is frictional. You've got the weight of a block, it's on a slope, and instead of pushing on the block, you know, so it's a horizontal surface and you're pushing on the block, we're going to actually change the direction of the surface so that a component of that weight is pressing down on the surface and a component is trying to, is parallel to the surface pushing it downward. And basically we do the static equilibrium and that TF and basically the uh, mobilized shear force along the, the surface is basically the weight of that times sine of alpha, which is, in other words, that the more the slope comes up, up the higher the alpha is, therefore the mobilized shear force increases, that component of the weight which actually attempts to induce failure. TFF is available shearing force. Now it has two components. One of them is the classic um, frictional failure, which is the WM cosine alpha tangent of phi, which is due to the cohesionless component of the soil. The thing that kind of takes this past pure coulombic failure is the cohesion of the soil, which itself offers resistance. And all that is, is the cohesion times the length of the slope, um, which is actually up and down the slope, not 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 side. This is a this is a um, <clears throat> force per unit length type of thing, and the factor of safety against the slope stability is equal to the to the resisting forces, which is the TFF over the driving force, which is TMOB. The presentation I'm about to give you on infinite slopes is based upon Broy. Uh, you also have a presentation of that in your Souls and Foundations manual. It is section 6.3.
Uh, the two are identical in terms of the results and the formulas you get. The difference between the two is that uh, Baroit refers to that slope as alpha. As you see, your DFE book does the same, while the um, while your the Souls and Foundations handbook refers to it as beta. Other than that, they're they're the same. Basically, we start here with a um, in this particular case, we have a purely cohesionless soil. The, we're assuming the failure surface and the slope are parallel. We're leaving the water table out for a minute. Um, the result is in the, and we saw what we're basically doing is a static equilibrium on an element. And Broit gets kind of fancy with that. But the bottom line is, is that once he goes through his derivation, that the factor of safety is a, is purely for if, you, if all these conditions are true and only if all these conditions are true then the factor of safety is equal to the tangent of the um, the frictional angle of the soil V over the tangent of the slope angle which is alpha there is it's not the depth of whatever failure surface we're assuming is not an issue here um, that's a nice result. It doesn't, it's not particularly complicated to figure. It doesn't necessarily happen very often, but it, it's a good place to start. And in some slopes, if you're dealing with a purely cohesive soil where you don't have uh, water flowing through, the, through it, it can be very useful. And in fact, one of the reasons why the Soils and Foundations Handbook spends so much time on slope stability is because slopes are a very important part of, of of most many transportation projects, embankments for highways and whatnot. And one of the reasons why that's true is because transportation projects frequently have the real estate to accommodate slopes. And that brings up something that I probably should have said something about sooner. A slope, in order for a slope, you know, changes of elevation are almost inevitable in, in sites, particularly in our part of the country where changes of elevation are just part of the landscape. And if you have the, the, an unsupported slope or an unreinforced slope, it's probably the, the simplest and the easiest change of elevation thing, method that we have. The, and in transportation projects, you frequently have the right of way to do that. In many cases, when you don't, we're going to start talking about reinforced slopes, and then we get into the whole issue of retaining walls. But that's a whole different, just, that's just sort of an aside. If we have steady state seepage in the, uh, in the soil, then we have a little bit different math, and again, Broit goes through that math, and you can see that. Basically, it assumes that the groundwater flow is parallel with the slope. Um, and we're also going to throw in something else. We're going to throw in the fact that uh, the infinite, that the slope is, uh, and we have some cohesion in it. We, have some, we may have be able to count on some of that. So basically, we go through and the, the uh, formula for F directly below the diagram, which includes cohesion, is, is the complete formula. Um, the one to the right of it leaves the cohesion out. So there, those are the only difference between the two. And you'll notice that if you look at the formula, uh, there are two things. First of all, if you look at the formula for the cohesion of the soil, the only difference between, if you were to take the unit weight of the water out of it, that formula, it reduces to the dry case. That's the only difference between the two. And in fact, if you were to take that formula on the left at the bottom and get rid of that, then you would have the, you know, you would have the result for a soil, for a slope, a dry slope, without any seepage at all. The gamma W is the only change. 
You'll also notice that the first term of that equation on the left, um, where C prime over gamma H sine alpha cosine alpha, that term is uh, independent of whether there's water there or not. That is one of the things about cohesive soils, in theory at least, they're independent of whether you have a water or not, at least in, in, in some ways they are. In this particular case, they are. One thing I'll add is that in all of, both of these cases are covered in the Soils and Foundations Handbook. The results are identical, even though the, 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 the nomenclature is a little different. Uh, the, in addition to this, the Soils and Foundations Handbook discussed the case where the water is, does not go all up to the surface. Again, with transportation projects and the number of embankments that they use, that's an important consideration for them. Let's take an infinite slope example. Given an infinite slope, the highest 15 feet, uh, the slope angle is 20 degrees, the soil has a phi of 10 degrees. This is the more Coulomb triple I was mentioning earlier in class. Um, the phi is 10 degrees, the C is 500 PSF, the cohesion and the unit weight is 110 PCF. It is saturated with seepage. Actually, um, a slope that, if you have a slope which has got water in it, you're going to have seepage. Why? Because if you have an elevation change, if you remember from permeability, inevitably water is going to flow if it's forced to go downhill. Find the factor of safety for translational phasor. All you do for this type of problems is plug and chug, and that's what you do. You put those variables in, you can compute it for yourself, but the factor of safety is 1.15. So we're kind of living on the edge with this particular slope. Now we come to rotational failure, or circular failure surfaces. And, well, for the most part, they're circular. There are many methods that have been developed since we've been working on this problem for over 100 years. One can expect this in geotechnical engineering. The friction circle method was a, is a graphic, semi-graphical method that was developed. Um, it was, has been used for many years. Uh, the handiest solutions for a long time were the chart solutions. Um, your Souls and Foundations Handbook goes into these in some detail, both Taylor's charts. Donald Taylor was one of the early greats of the soil, mechan of soil mechanics and foundations, and he unfortunately passed away at 55, but uh, his textbook on the subject is an excellent one. And Yan Bu uh, charts are basically the, the same, but they're presented differently with some other improvements to them. They're a good way for preliminary calculations. I would not use them for a final design, certainly not now, but for checking to see if your software is behaving nicely, they're a good idea. And that brings up something else. Accepting results from the computer blindly is a recipe for disaster. And you as an engineer, need to be aware of that and need to, to in integrate that into your practice. Um, as some of you know, my PhD is in computational engineering and that's one of the first things they want to teach is, is don't take for granted anything or don't take at face value anything that comes out of a computer. Um, there's non-circular failure surfaces. Uh, there are some cases the vertical slopes and we've kind of touched on that in a sort of a crude way, um, but vertical slopes are important with, uh, particularly with cohesive soils. In fact, exclusively with cohesive soils, because with cohesive soils you cannot have a vertical slope. Now I come to the method of slices, and I'm going to explain what that means. Uh, there are several of them, the Fellenius method, the ordinary method of slices, the Bishop's method, uh, Spencer's, Morgan's and Price, GLE. This is the classic way to analyze slope stability. By hand, these are very computationally intensive, and that's one reason why I don't really, um, really, since 
fairly early in my career teaching this course, I don't normally require students to do it by hand anymore. Probably the best methods are finite element methods. The uh, individual whose name has associated with really making these viable for slope stability and other things is Von Griffiths at the Colorado School of Mines. And this is probably the best because the advantage of a finite element method is that you don't assume a failure surface. And that's especially useful when you have multi-layer soils and complicated phreatic surfaces and all that. Um, again, there, you, know, you need a way of checking it, and that's good to have a method of checking it. But on the other hand, and in fact, you could use, if you wanted to, a, a, a circular failure surface method in, in one software package and then find another to kind of look at each other and maybe chart solutions a third. It's always good to check what you're doing. What we're talking about is a limit equilibrium method, and we, I, I touched on that earlier. I'm going to come back to it. Limit equilibrium method is basically a method where we compare the, uh, the forces that are driving the failure against those that are resisting it. And as long as the failures that are resist, sources that are resisting it or the, um, the soil properties that are resisting it are greater than those which are uh, driving it by a factor of safety, then we're generally okay with this. Um, limit equilibrium, assume the validity of Coulomb's failure criterion. Um, again, this whole thing is driven by more Coulomb failure, as I talked about earlier. And we normally assume, we're really kind of assuming that this slope is going nowhere, or at least not much of anywhere, until it fails, and then it's going, then it will fail catastrophically. And that pretty much squares with our actual experience with it. Basically the way that method of slices works is like this in Broy. You have a circular slip surface, you assume a circular slip surface, and that's one of the key assumptions in this whole thing. And you actually um, divide it up into vertical slices. Those, each of those slices has a mass. Each of those slices has one or more um, unit weights, soil properties, cohesions, um, values of phi. Um, you know, a perfectly homogeneous slope only has one, but there's more than that. And then basically, as at the equation at the bottom of the page, we sum up all of those slices you know, the, 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 the weight is dr what's driving this. The weight of the slice is driving this entire thing down. It's trying to drive the entire thing downward. And we compare it to the resistance offered by the slip surface at the bottom of, of each slice. And we add them all up. And we can compare the two from the, using the factor of safety. If the factor of safety is acceptable, then we can proceed with the slope design. Valenius' method is the simplest, and it was the one that Walmart Valenius came up with. It basically assumes that the only forces, and there are only three forces involved. First, the weight of the, of the uh, slice, which is downward. Then you have a, ten, that creates both tangential and normal forces at the base of the slice. The um, Tangential forces are what actually are keeping this this in place. Well, the normal forces are too. They're obviously not permitting it to go further into the ground. But the tangential, the tau, is really what is keeping this from actually experiencing slip circle failure. And as a result of that, as long as we have the ten, as long as that as the soil resistance there, the combination of cohesion and or its um, frictional due to internal friction of the soil is, gr is greater by a factor of safety than it is than the weight. And that's summed up over all the slices you saw in the previous slide. Then we have, and that's it. 
it is the nice thing about Philaneus's method is it's statically determined. Each of those slices is statically determined. You don't have to iterate to a solution. Um, for it is the most conservative solution. You know, it yields the most conservative results. For purely cohesive soils, Philaneus's method and the next method we discuss, which is Bishop's method, give identical results. And so um, it's, it's a good place to start, and traditionally it's been used to uh, instruct students on how to do slip circle methods. As I said, in, in this particular uh, course, we will not be doing actual calculations of slices. Bishop's method adds the effect of the side forces on the slice. The problem, the, the good, and actually I would say that Bishop's method, and I think your the Solzhen Foundation handbook backs that up, is the most common method used, even though there are other methods that have been um, developed. Bishop's method is the, is, an, is simply, is not statically determinate. It requires an iterative solution to make it work. And that has create, creates computational issues, if you're particularly if you're doing it by hand, and also even doing it with a spreadsheet. This is an ideal spreadsheet problem. Your Souls and Foundation handbook discuss. I have, actually have an example of this and how it works. Um, it can be done on a spreadsheet, but again, with Bishop's method, you have to iterate to a solution, which is um, fairly. Uh, with, with because of the fact that it's statically determined. Um, the charts, I'm only going to concentrate on Yen Bo's charts. Yen Bo's charts, in my opinion, and, and if you, um, for, I'm going to concentrate on Yen Bo's charts in purely cohesive soils. And that's pretty much where my focus your Souls and Foundation handbook goes into Taylor's charts. It also has a lot more on the end boost charts for soils with both cohesion and internal friction. We're going to focus on slope stability charts for purely cohesive slopes. And these are what the, the these are them and they, they are also reproduced in the Souls and Foundations handbook as well. And this gives you an example. Notice that we have on the right, on, on the chart on the left, there are two of them. One of them is a stability analysis, which gives you the basic stability. There are three types of circles that we normally consider with slope analysis, and that's true whether you're using a chart or whether you're doing something else. We have a slope circle. A slope circle assumes, and you're looking at that diagram in the upper left-hand corner of the slide. The slope circle assumes that the failure surface starts at the top of the slope. Well, they all do that, but it ends before it reaches the base of the slope. A toe circle assumes that the failure, sur that the failure surface ends at the where the at the sort of the knee of the, the bottom of the slope, and a base circle assumes that it goes all the way down to the. Um, to a, to a hard surface. You notice we, you know, we spend a lot of time assuming that in, in geotechnical problems that somewhere down there there is a firm surface and in many stratigraphies that is the case. You'll also notice a couple of other things and I want you to point because you're going to run into these in um, slope stability and other things. First of all, the upper left hand corner the slope angle is divided in one or two ways. One of them is beta, an angle. That's obviously a, a slope that is not a slope at all has a beta of zero. And the slope that is purely vertical straight up has a beta of 90 and everything else is in between. You'll also see slopes uh, quoted in one over two or one over three. That is also shown up there. You'll see that fairly commonly with slopes as well and it is very sometimes your your slopes slopes and foundation have a little bit different notation and we'll go into that the factor of safety that is that equation that I mentioned to you earlier and it does have 
and we're going to be using that. Uh, the stability number over on the on the right side of that, we actually, for a given slope with a given um, uh, fact, with, with, for, for a given slope, given geometry, and given soil properties, we have, um, you know, we, this, the chart actually gives us the stability number. As you said, with vertical slopes, we saw it could vary between two and four. Obviously, if we start actually getting away from vertical slopes, you'll see the stability number will increase, which makes sense. For and the, there's an example on the towards on the left chart towards the bottom right of the left chart is the is a very simple example where you've got a purely cohesive slope. The there are two vertical variables you need to be with h, which is the height of the slope, and d which is the distance from the base of the slope down to the firm base, whatever that happens to be. Um, the unit weight is 115, the cohesion is 600, and um, the charts in order to use them require you to, uh, to have D as a ratio of D over H. Now, little d is equal to big D, which is the actual distance over H, which is 20 feet over 25 feet, or 0 0.8. And then you have beta is 35 degrees, that is the slope angle. That could have been given in 1 over little b or whatever. And then basically what you do, the first thing you do is to compute the the first thing you need to do is to check out what n naught would be. Well, n naught is equal to the following. If, if this is 35 degrees, which would put it right here, and little d is 0 0.8, which brings it up to here, about right up into this area, about right here where my, the cursor is, and you come over and you'll get about a n naught of 5.8. Then you plug and chug the rest. The C is given, the gamma T is given, the H is given, and you get a factor of safety of about 1.21. It also shows you that based upon what side of this line it's on, this line right here, whether it's a base circle or a toe circle. In this case, being on this side of the line, it's a base circle it's right here. That's important because the next chart, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on the next chart, actually shows you where the failure surface is depending upon whether it's a what, what and obviously is divided up with toe circle base circle or slope circle so you take that information from this chart and use it to locate the center of the slip circle every slip circle obviously has to have a center somewhere it's normally located above the slope sometimes it can actually be in front of the slope it's not very often behind it, but um, it, it generally will, it is in this region above the slope. And our, my own example, given a slope with a CU of 40 kPa, co that's cohesion. Make sure you use cohesion and not the um, um, and, and not undrained, un unconfined compression train. The gamma is 17.5 kilonewtons per cubic meter, and beta is 60. The slope angle is 60. It's a fairly steep slope. Find the maximum depth of excavation without slope failure. Radius of critical servo and factor of safety is unity, and distance from the crown of the slope to the slip circle at the top of the slope. The first thing I'm going to do, actually, um, because of the nature of this slope, beta is 60, all just about all of the, at that high of a of, of a beta that steep of a slope and it's in the breakout is about 55 degrees and up all of the um all all of your slopes at that are toe circles so i come up there's only one line to pick i come over and i get a um Stability number of I think it's about 5.3, which or 5.2 actually. And again, you know, uh, you know, some of you get really nervous about this. Um, these charts are not exact. I know that you're going to read them differently, and 
and, and, and so we have to take that, I take that into consideration. Assume a factor of safety of unity since I didn't give you one. Uh, if I'd given you one, it would change that. So all I do is solve this equation down here for the for the height. In other words, instead of fs equal to n naught, um, you know, c over gamma t h, I solve it. H is equal to c n naught over gamma fs. I solve it. I get 11.9 meters. Obviously, that's not a very wise, you know, to, to design at the limit like that is not wise, but we, it's, a, it's an example of how the maximum height, you need to, need to reduce the height from that, from 11.9 down to something lower than that. Note that from where the chart is, it's a toe circle, as I've mentioned before. From there, armed with that information, we know it's going to be one of these. From now, this chart's a little trickier to use. Um, there are the unit abscissa and the unit ordinate is how we locate the location of this point. For a 60 degree slope angle, the, it's simple. It's zero. This is the these are the unit um, abscissa curves right here. And for that high, again, you know, for that high, uh, your options kind of run out. With a t for the ordinate, the toe circle has a unique curve. You don't have to worry about, you know, different D values for the base circles. Um, and it lands about, like I said, the unit epsis and ordinate for the center. This is sort of the ratio of the, uh, epsis, the location of this for H. And notice with a toe circle that, generally speaking, that in some cases, this can be behind the circle, or in front of it, actually. So the toe circle is up here. This, at 60 degrees, hits about 1.5. And that's, we simply multiply. And therefore, the location of this is 17.8 meters straight up from the it's about right up, up here somewhere. It's 17.8 meters straight up from the base of the, of the slope. And that's how you use those charts. I think also your Souls and Foundations Handbook have some fairly extensive examples of those as well. Um, again, the, the, that is the, we're going to the method of slices. I, as I said, I don't expect you to actually do the method of slices, I think you should have a basic understanding of them. There are two we're going to talk about, Philenius and Bishops. And Philenius is mostly for historical, again, with purely cohesive soils, the two methods are identical in result. What we're going to do is to use uh, computer software. It automates many of the processes that are required it eliminates the need for iterative solutions, except in, in one, there's one exception to that, and I'm going to mention it. It enables running multiple cases and varying parameters without difficulty. And we're going to use the simple slope software program from Veroy. I'm going to take an example. It's in the Souls and Foundations Handbook. And we're going to use, show how the software actually works. They use, um, a different method. They use a chart solution for it. We're going to actually do it by uh, method of slices using the computer software. Computer software is available at my website under the slope stability um, under, under, under in the slope stability section. So it should be easy. It's an easy program to run. In fact, I'll just show it to you real quick here. It's a simple program. It requires, doesn't, don't have to install it. You can run on the university's computers if you can get to the university's computers. But any Windows computer that will run 32-bit software pretty much will run this. It has no printed output. It has no file output. What you have to do is to take a screenshot of this thing. Now, back in the 1980s when I was doing... My, some of my first technical papers and I was demonstrating some software I developed I would actually go to uh, my computer and I would set up a film camera in front of 
under the monitor and turn the lights out in the room so it wouldn't get screen glare. And I would take pictures. That's how I, that's how screenshots were done in the old days. And it really wasn't, uh, it, was, it was another 10 or 15 years before it really got any better. Um, the problem, or at least much better, I think, I'm not sure about whether Windows 3.1, I think 95 and 98 had it. Um, a decent screenshot, but um, capabilities either integral, I've forgotten. But in any event, I've noticed the past couple of years when some of the students do this that they actually get out their camera phones and they take a shot of the screen. And very frequently, this shot will not be straight at the screen, it will not take into account glare. And in any event, given the fact that virtually every operating system on the planet has a screen grab on it now, I find any you know all you have to do is take a screenshot of it and stick it in your homework or you upload it and you're done. There is really no good reason why you should have to do screen um, uh, screenshots the way we did them 30, 35 years ago. In any event, problem below the water table is the basis slope. Since this is program strictly runs in SI, um, it uh, we're going to have to convert all the parameters to SI. That's no big deal. The slope has a gamma T of 18.9 kilonewtons per cubic meter. The CU is 23.9 kilopascals, and the height of the slope is 10.7 meters. Since the slope is 1.5 horizontal, 1 vertical, um, that means that, and, and that's another way of quoting that, that means that the length of the slope, the slope, the horizontal length of the slope is 1.5 times its height. So therefore it's 10.7 times 1.5 or 16 meters. That's the way the program takes the data. Uh, the foundation, which is the soil below the this toe of the slope, is gam is 18. It's the same unit weight. The CU is 47.9 kPa, or twice that of the of the slope itself, and the height is uh, and the depth of that down to the base is 7.6 meters. So with that, we're going to pull the slope software up, and we're going to enter some of this data. The first is the length of the slope is, and now, now, now you see why I, um, now you see why I put that in there. The height of the slope is 10.7 meters. Oops, 0.7 meters. The water level on the on both sides at this point is zero. We're going to change that. Eventually, the unit weight of the water is close enough. The dry unit weight, since we didn't bother to give you dry and wet unit weights, we're just going to use 18.9. And the saturated unit weight is 18.9 again. The cohesion is 23.9. Just The friction angle on the soil is 20 degrees at the, for the embankment. This is for the brown region. Let me just make sure you, you're clear on which is which. Notice that the problem is given this region is the brown region in the software and this is the yellow region in the software. Now, the friction, the neutral stress coefficient, we're going to talk about this in more detail, but for our purposes at this point is 1 minus sine phi. And um, for 20 degrees, 1 minus sine phi is 0 0.66. Now, 1 minus sine 20 is what that is. The dry unit of the subsoil is 18.9. The saturated unit weight is 18.9 again. The cohesion of the subsoil, we've got to move us a little bit, is 47.9. The friction angle of the subsoil is zero. It's purely cohesive. That means the neutral for a purely cohesive stress, the neutral stress coefficient is unity. One minus sine of zero is one. Now this is where it gets tricky. 
lower left corner there is a window here and I'm gonna go ahead and expand it just a little bit let's see uh, lower left corner Y is we'll leave we'll leave that at um, we'll put that at 12 and the upper right hand corner is going to be 10 and the upper right hand corner will be 20 lower left hand corner upper right hand corner this software does uses what is called grid optimization and what it's trying to do is to find the slip circle and so what it does is that every one of those corners both the outside corners and the inside intersections of the lines are points at which it assumes the center of the slip circle and once it does that it goes through all the calculations and all the slices um, and then it gives you the factor of safety it goes through all the calculations and so the problem, the thing about it is, and that's a crude optimization technique. Optimization techniques are one of the most important aspects of engineering and just everything these days that is never discussed at undergraduate level. Optimization is basically taking a system of, in, in rough terms, a system of mathematical equations and finding the best value of the best value depending on or the minimum or a minimum or a maximum in this case we're looking for the minimum we're looking for the minimum a minimum or a maximum or in some cases a zero value of an of some kind of equation that we've put together that equation doesn't have to be a closed form equation it can be a system of equations it can be any kind of thing and, opt and unfortunately, we don't really have time to do it, but this is the uh, grid optimization is, is brute force. It takes a system of equations, that's an equation, and it just picks points in a grid, and literally, in this case, literally a grid, and it checks to see which one. It doesn't do anything like hunt for the best point. I still, I believe most uh, slope stability programs are still doing it this way even though some of them probably have a little bit fancier way of setting the grid up than this one does. At least I hope so. I believe they're doing it. The last thing is the deepest point of the slip circle. The deepest point of the slip circle is probably the um, foundation is 7.6 and we have to enter that as a negative number. I'm going to start with that. That's not necessarily the only way. Now having done all, all my data is now in place. Um, I want Bishop's method. Why do I want Bishop? I ask for Bishop's method, and I run it. Now, I because I made a big grid to start with, I have succeeded in 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 the middle. What your object is, you want your slip circle center to be somewhere in one of these interior points, in other words, this one, this one, this one, one of these nine points. You don't want it on the edge. If you're on the edge, that means that the reality is probably off the edge. So you want to make sure they're in one of these nine. And if you want a more exact answer, you need to tighten the grid up. And I'm going to show you how to do that. First, let's tighten the grid this way. What How I do is the upper right corner, let's say go down to 18 and that's not much tighter and then I run it again you have to run it every time and I'm getting pretty much the same answer now let's tighten it the other way the lower left corner is 2 maybe make that 5 or 6 and I run it again at this point I'm not getting much of an improvement so I might want to just call it a day what I expect is that your result the slip circle will be in the right here in the middle notice I have 1.3 that answer is different from the one in the book why because I'm assuming a different toaster I'm assuming a different location I'm assuming a base circle in this case I'm getting one what would happen if I went to a toe circle 
Now, obviously, 1.3, that may be. What I would do as a practical matter, if I was using this software for design, I don't recommend it, by the way. I would basically, this is the big variables, the one right down here. Everything else pretty much sets up. Once you get your center inside the slip circle, you're pretty much home free. But this thing down here can vary. I have a base circle here. What would happen if I went to a toe circle? Well, in this software, it's not a true toe circle, just to be just to be honest. But the closest thing I can do is set the deepest point of the slip circle as zero. Now look, actually, I could go maybe minus one. Let's see, well, I'm going to, have to just run it. So I run it. Now I'm in trouble. Because now I'm on the edge. What do I do? I take the lower left hand corner. I go to say four. And I run it again. Now I'm right. Now I'm really getting in trouble. Um, I have to raise this back up. 20. 20 say 20. And I run it again. I'm still not. So maybe I need to go to this way. But I'm still not, maybe I need to just go to zero. Now I'm starting to get somewhere. By the way, the lower left hand corner cannot be any less than zero. This, this thing does not like to do center, circle centers out here. And then we'll go to 24, say, and then we'll run it again. I'm 1.6 now. Now I could tighten the grid up, and I'll do that by pulling the upper, say, to 6. I'll run it. I'm getting a little bit different result. Notice that there's all. This is not one of the reasons why grid optimization is still used is that sometimes finding the optimum is tricky, and that's true in a lot of geotechnical problems. Many geotechnical problems have this issue. Um, there are why a lot of classic don't get used, but notice it's pretty close to a slope circle. Notice also that the factor of safety is higher than the base circle. So therefore, it's reasonable that we should design this to a base circle. Let's say we want to see what minus 3 would do. It's halfway. Well, we got to do a little um, moving of the upper right hand corner or upper, yeah, the X upper right hand corner. Let's go to 10. And we'll run it again. And we see 1.4. We actually got our worst result when it was actually a base circle. And so. That's, that's the only thing that the program really doesn't automate. We're going to come back to this program in just a minute when we come to Morgan Stern's method. But this is that's basically how you use it. That's the use of it. Then you, when you're done, you, you, if you change anything in the input data, you have to rerun it. Anything. Doesn't matter what it is. It's going to give you a different result. Okay. Other types, um, uh, Spencer and Morgan Stern Price um, are more, they require equilibrium and obviously a, um, you know, a, a computer program can do these, but really Bishop's method remains the most commonly used, whether it's with software or whatever. Because if you get past Bishop's method, really, in my opinion, you're better off using the, going the final element method. The one thing I want to talk about is Morgan Stern's rapid drawdown method. And that's important because uh, one of the, and I'll, I'll show you why, it's it probably the easiest way to explain Back in the early 1960s, Morgan Stern did a fairly extensive research on what happens when you have a slope that is going into the water and the water lowers. Now, those of us who live in around TVA lakes or any kind of know of, of artificial lakes know that in the winter time those lakes are lowered, and in the summer those lakes go back up. And it's possible 
in certain situations that if they're and they're slopes, they're all kind of natural slopes, people made slopes, whatever. And as a result, it's entirely possible to have to for those slopes to fail just because. And I want to show you that. So Morgan Stern and probably a graduate student did a lot of ca hand calculations using Bishop's method, by the way, and came up with the drawdown charts. I think there's an easier way to do that. I want to show you what it is, and it also illustrate why this is important. All right, let's get our rapid drawdown method. The same problem we had before, except the right on the water table at the top of the slope, the left water table areas. Factors of safety as water is drawn down. Classic Morgan rapid drawdowns assumes a toe circle, so we're going to stick with that. All right, first, the water table. The water table on the right side is the top of the slope, so therefore it is 10.7 high. Whoops. Now, I'm going to start with the water table on the other side being 10.7. In other words, I'm going to start with this. And this, obviously, 10.7 meters is a major, excuse me, uh, is a major draw, is, is a major drawdown. But, you know, you can always scale that. You know, smaller slopes will have smaller failures, I guess. And, but the failure is, failure is a failure. We're going to start with this both. And now since I said toe circle, I'm just going to set this equal to zero just to keep things simple. Now, let's run this. I'm going to run this at full half. In other words, I'm going to draw this water down, down to halfway down the slope and then all the way down the slope. So I got Bishop's method. I run it. And I get a factor of safety of 2.69. I'm, I'm going to leave. I, I really need to... It's not exactly a toe circle, but it's pretty close. If I wanted to minus 0.5 and see if I could get, yeah, I can get a little closer to a toe circle. Let's just do that. 2.93. See how much it varies? You know, it even varies. Now, that's a good, that's a pretty stout factor, say, but this is all saturated. If you draw down. If you have a change of water level, chances are that if you've got a soil next to it, if the water level is stable, the phreatic surface in the soil will be even with the water level of the lake or the harbor or whatever it's next to. But if you draw that down, chances are that the soil permeability, be it particularly if it's a cohesive soil, is not going to be able to react that quickly. And as a result, what will happen is, is that for design purposes and for all intents and purposes, the level on the right side will be stationary and the level on the left side will drop. Let's, for example, do that. Let's drop this halfway, which means that would be 5.35 feet. And let's run it. Now you see there's been a dramatic reduction in the factor of safety. And all I did, and actually I probably should go to zero here. Um, for your problems, I would not probably do that much of, of that. But anyway, at 1.4, um, I, I would just put the, the, this at the bottom and be done with it for most of what you're doing. And last but not least, so okay, you see the dramatic drop in factor of safety. This is still saturated. This is still the lake. And then I go to zero water on the left side. I drain this thing all the way down. And now I'm down to 1.17. What is happening is you, you get an unbalanced hydrostatic force on the right hand side, on the slope side. And that hydrostatic force, in addition, is, is helping to drive, becomes a driving force to basically lower your, to basically 
basically try to do slope failure. And as you see, the factor of safety drops dramatically when you do a draw, do a drawdown like that. Now we could use lower slopes, but you know, you scale it down, it's pretty much you're going to get the same kind of result. So that's why Morgan Stern's problem was and is important to us today. And this program allows you to actually simulate that without having to look at with a bunch of charts. How to fix slope stability problems? There are several ways of doing it. One of them is to change the geometry of it. You have the, the possibility of actually flattening the slope, lowering the slope, um, excavate a bench in it. You can do an earth burn fill at the bottom. This is particularly good when you've got toe circle failure. Um, put a berm at the bottom. The most common way of dealing with the slope stability problem if you don't have the real estate is to do some type of restraining structure, either partial or total. And what I mean by that is that you'll see here you've got a little retaining structure here then and they only did part of the way. They only they got rid of part of the slope. Now if they can get rid of part of the slope and and we're going to talk about the effect of broken what what is called broken backfill here when we get into retaining walls and foundations. But you know your retaining, you know your your retaining structures are um, only only partially got rid of the slope, or you can completely you could actually in some cases like you have is here completely get rid of it. All you, sometimes you can also put the wall at the top. That's more effective if you've got an overburden problem on the top of the slope. In other words, if you've got loads at the top of the slope. One of the things we have not really discussed in this part of slope stability is whether or not you have um, whether with you have any kind of surcharge loads or whatnot on the top of a slope or top of a retaining wall. That adds to the uh, loading on the slope and decreases its stability. Um, these are, one thing they talk about is drill cast in place vertical piles. These are uh, Typically, if you make a wall, a, a solid wall out of them, uh, sometimes you can make, you can, you can space them out and put some kind of lagging between them, like a soldier beam. Uh, although you usually don't use drill piles, though, but more commonly they'll put them, they'll essentially take drill piles and they'll put them in a row. Those are secant piles. And there's also a possibility of earth and rock anchors. In an area like ours, where rock is fairly close to the surface, this is frequently a viable option. And finally, MSC walls are reinforced earth. And we'll talk about those in foundations. Other solutions include lightweight fill. Obviously, the lower the weight, the better. And the rest of these solutions we discussed in the previous slide. These are more descriptions of pile stabilized slopes which are somewhat common. Another one thing that I did not mention, and I think we did in the previous slide, is geogrids. Um, geogrids are not restricted to MSC walls that can be used for different types of slope stability and also to prevent slope erosion as well. And this is the slide, as my students know all too well, means that the presentation is done, that it is, that it's complete. And normally I open up the class for questions, but this is the end of, of stability.